Stanford University. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm really excited to ha have Scott Sandiel here from NEA. Um, the timing is actually perfect given that last week NEA announced their $3.1 billion fund. It's their 15th fund and um, Scott's one of the two big wigs there as one of the two managing partners, um, managing general partners. Um, so the $3.1 billion is um, probably the largest fund that has been raised in venture history. Um, NEA has successfully raised um, a number of billion dollar funds, but this is the largest so far. Um, so Scott himself is a very successful investor. He's been on the Forbes Midas list every year since 2007, I believe. Since it got restarted, yeah. Since it got restarted, so very impressive. Um, he's also invested in eight, um, eight billion dollar unicorn companies. So companies including Salesforce, Workday, um, WebEx, and a number of other companies. Um, from what I understand, he started his career um, after college as a management consultant at BCG. Um, he then ended up working at a software startup as the first salesperson and then um, started the European division for that company. Um, the company got acquired. He went back to school, um, gained some experience at the business school, and then um, ended up working at Microsoft as a product manager in what ended up being Windows 95. And then um, from there, he um, did some consulting work and then ended up um, being at NEA and has been there since then. He's also chair of the National Venture Capital Association, so sees a lot of, in terms of what happens um, within venture capital, not just at NEA, but nationwide. And um, very excited to have him here. And congratulations on the new fund. Thank you. Thank you, Ernestine. Uh, well, I'm excited to be here. It's always fun to come back to Stanford and uh, share a few things. It's been, I've been in venture capital almost 20 years. I started in January of 1996. So next January will be 20 years. Uh, and it's, it's a huge privilege to do what we do. Um, you know, we invest other people's money. These people give us their money for 12 years with three one-year extensions in our case. So for 15 years, they give us their money. Uh, now almost 17 billion in our 37-year history. And then we get to invest in people's dreams and help them out. And it's really, really cool. I was just telling Louise that I'm especially pumped today because I, uh, I just came from a board meeting of a company that the world doesn't really know about yet called Datrium that we incubated in our office about two years ago. And they now have a working beta product that really, really works. And uh, so they showed us that at the board meeting and it's gonna completely rock the storage world. It's just all bets are off for anyone else in that game. Um, so we're really excited about it. It's a team that we knew super well because they were the founders of Data Domain, another company that we incubated back in 2001 and was bought by EMC in 2009 after going public. So it's, it's just really fun when you, when you can be a part of something like that from the very beginning and see how it all comes together and ultimately a you know, product that changes the lives of customers, which this one certainly will. So, um, so that's a little bit about what I've been up to today. I thought uh, in response to your question, I would talk a little bit about the history of Silicon Valley. Um, I sort of assume this stuff is really well known, so I'll try to go through it reasonably quickly uh, and, uh, and then talk uh, more about today and what I think is going to happen in the future. So let's see. I have to figure out how to make this work. Uh, just NEA by the numbers, I'm going to get through this quickly, but 37 years, 200 IPOs, 300 m and AX, it's attractive returns for a long period of time. Um, about 70 professionals worldwide. And we're, we're global, we have offices in China and India. We've historically made approaching 1,000 investments on five continents. We have about 450 portfolio companies. As a frame of reference, we invest in about 30 new seed investments a year, which for us is less than $500,000, and about 30 other investments, which average about 20 to $30 million, depending on the sector. So they usually start smaller than that and, and grow, but sometimes, especially at later stages, we'll invest 50 or 75 or 100 in the first uh, instance. And then in terms of the diversity of where the capital goes, you can see we're spread out all over the U.S., 15% international and growing. Um, you can see the composition is mostly very early stage. Uh, that's a little bit skewed by the fact that we measure it from the first time we invest. So later stage rounds that would have been considered growth rounds had we done them as the first investment actually make up a lot more capital than 28% when you add that in. So it's probably 50-50 or something like that. And then, you know, very heavy in technology, a little bit in energy, that's 
faded away in the last few years for all the reasons you know. Um, really challenging sector, but I think one of the things that's unique to NEA is that because we have these large funds and we invest out of one fund, with the exception of this new one, we have an opportunity fund, which uh, allows us to just add on a little bit more in, in special places. But think of it mainly as one fund. Uh, we, can, we can run a pretty large experiment in a new sector. So I helped to create that uh, energy investing practice back in 2002 or three when we invested in Bloom Energy, one of the ones that's really working well. But that we then went on to invest in 35 other ones. Most of them didn't work out. It was never more than 15% of our fund. So while it's painful to lose 15% of your, you know, we didn't lose it all, but you know, lose a, a chunk of money like that, it's not deadly. And uh, the diversity that we have, also you can see a big component in healthcare, think biotech and uh, medical devices, uh, gives us consistent returns, which are very hard to achieve if you're just in one sector or another. Um, and, and then I guess the only last thing I'd say about NEA, um, the founders wanted this firm to last 100 years. It's why their name isn't on the door, and it's why they built a firm that's broadly based in terms of ownership, in terms of compensation, and most importantly, a very strong culture of teamwork. Uh, so we work together uh, on, on all of our projects, and it's more fun that way, and it's also better for the companies. They get a, you know, a, a, I guess a broader set of experience. So this company, Datrium, as an example, um, my partner Forrest Basket and I are, on, are both on the board and we've been working on it since the beginning. Forrest and I have done a lot of companies together um, and I think the entrepreneurs like that because Forrest was a computer science professor at Stanford, uh, a really, really good one. In fact, SGI, Sun Microsystems and MIPS all came out of his lab. He's the one who recruited uh, Jim Barksdale to Stanford to the faculty uh, and later went to be the CTO of Silicon Graphics for 13 years before coming to NEA. Um, my background's obviously very different than that, so it's, it's highly complimentary, and, and obviously we work well together. Um, you know, some things about Silicon Valley are kind of the same. You know, these two companies, uh, Hewlett Packard started with $500, 000, $500 in, uh, in a garage that you all know is located not far from here, uh, and then Google 60 years later in a garage located a little bit over that way. Um, but a lot of things have, have changed. I think the culture of Silicon Valley is, is actually pretty different. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this, but um, I mean, there are now TV shows and movies about what happens here. That's certainly, with the exception of this old book that we dug up, there wasn't really that much, nobody paid attention to Silicon Valley pre-1990 or so. Uh, and it was really people who came here, uh, almost exclusively engineers. You know, they, there, there weren't very many business people running around. Uh, even Bill, uh, your co-professor, is himself uh, you know, an eminent technologist, first and foremost, in addition to being a CEO. Um, and that, that's really the, the style of, um, of people that came here. Uh, I, I think it, it's helpful to think about what, what kinds of companies were being created back then and what what, what kinds of talent you needed. So in the beginning, these companies were research projects investing mostly in hardware, which was used by the Defense Department. And that was the beginning of a lot of these companies. Uh, it, it, by the sort of mid 80s, the, you know, the predominant focus was on enterprises. And enterprises were the ones that adopted the leading edge technologies first. And of course now, consumers are the ones who adopt leading edge technology, and I think that is a useful framework when you think about why the culture has changed and what kinds of people come here and what sort of things they do today. So just keep that in mind as, as we go through. Um, the landscape has changed enormously. I mean, this was a peach orchard, you know, right around here 30 years ago. I came here to the valley first in 1988, and it was a very different feeling than, than it is today. Um, you know the story of all the companies that uh, that have resulted from that. Uh, and you probably know that the venture capital industry itself has evolved quite a lot along the way. Um, NEA's first fund, raised in 1978, was $6 million. Our second fund was $16 million. The third fund was $35 million. That was about 10 years later. We invest $35 million in the first half hour of our partners meetings on a Monday now. 
sometimes more. Um, it's just a very, very different world from a scale perspective. But I think one of the things that's interesting to me about this particular time, we're going to talk a lot about what's happening right now because I think it's a really, really different time in the entire history of Silicon Valley and venture capital. One of the things that's interesting to me about it as an investor is that the amount of capital available is roughly what's needed to fund all these startups. And that's what you need to have for the ecosystem to be in balance. As you know, back in the late 90s, when $100 billion was raised by our industry in one year, uh, and, and then in subsequent years, slightly less than that, there was way too much money. And the number of ideas wasn't that great. And the returns were terrible for an entire decade. Um, now we're back into reasonable equilibrium. We've been investing, the industry has raised about $20 billion for the last, since the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, last year it went up to 30 billion, and it'll probably go up a little more this year. Uh, but if you adjust that for inflation, that's roughly the same as the industry raised in 1996 when I joined. So to me, that's always kind of a rough measure uh, uh, of things. A, a lot of things are different, but it's about the same amount of money. What, what's I think different is the composition of where the money comes from and into whose hands it ends up. So as we all know, there's a gigantic proliferation of angels investing. This happened in the late 90s too, by the way. You know, when there's been a lot of success in Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs who've been successful invest in their friends and so on. Um, and there have been some really remarkable successes for a lot of those angels, so they became micro VCs. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing for tr traditional venture capitalists like us because, as we'll get to, when these companies grow up, they, they need typically quite a lot more capital than any of their original investors can provide. Uh, and the number of venture capitalists with sizable pools of capital is actually about the same as it's been for a very long time. Uh, so that part of the industry is, I think, in balance. And then what we're now seeing, and I'm sure you read about, is that at the very later stages of the market, there are all kinds of new players. This also happened in the late 90s, when hedge funds and mutual funds and all sorts of people decide that they want to get into the game, and they want to get into the game specifically because these companies are staying private a lot longer, and a lot of the upside of these companies are actually captured by the private investors before they go public. You know, the, the 10x upside that they used to be able to get when the company went public at a $250 million valuation in the mid 80s and grew to two and a half billion over time just isn't there. Uh, nobody's even going public for less than a couple of billion. And that's usually because the companies are bigger and more mature. We'll talk more about that. Um, I think there's, there's also um, been consolidation within the class of larger venture capital firms. This, of course, has happened in most every other um, service provider market that you can think of. I think uh, venture capital is a little bit different. Um, it, it, the people that we think of as having comparable amounts of capital, although they, although they typically have it in separate funds, are up here in the top right-hand corner. Uh, Sequoia, Axel, Kleiner Perkins. And then the next group down has materially less capital. And then these guys are the new, the new guys um, who have very small amounts of capital, typically. I, I think this is unlikely to change a lot. Um, it's, it is both very hard to stay at the top of the heap, and it's also very hard to get there. Um, it's just the, the evolution of a partnership itself is really difficult. One of the things that some of my friends who have started micro VC firms have come to realize after six or eight or 10 years doing it is that when you raise a fund and people give you money for 10 or 12 years, you need to have an organization that's going to be around a long time. And just having people who want to do that together and evolving the, that group and getting them to work together, not so easy. So once you get to a certain scale, then you get to this, this um, wonderful place where one or two people don't matter that much. You know, the, the firm will survive without you. And that's a, that's a wonderful feeling. There are associated overheads that come with managing large organizations, but the benefit of stability is really, really important. Uh, we talked about uh, the cyclicality of our industry a little bit. It's dramatic. There are no barriers to entry in venture capital. Anybody who can raise money can put out a shingle and invest it. Um, and so consequently, when times are good, 
Lots of money flows in, returns go down, typically, as we mentioned, and then they go up again when, um, when the money has run away. Uh, you know, another thing that has, of course, a constant over all this time is that technology is always changing. Uh, but it's interesting, it, it's, it's a little bit terrifying, actually, sometimes, to think about where the next thing is likely to come from. Because um, it's not entirely obvious when you have a 12 or 15 year perspective. You know, we, we, we know what we're excited about for the next five years. But if you ask me, what are we gonna invest in in 10 years? I have no idea. Completely clueless. And the only comforting thing is that if I think back to 10 years ago, would I have predicted what we're investing in now? Maybe half of it, but half of it probably not. Um, I also think it's just interesting to look at what kinds of innovations have changed the game. User interface innovations. Um, you know, the, these things, you know, cell phones, are as powerful as those things, literally. Mainframe computer 25 years ago, right here. Who would, who would have believed that? You know, I remember when my dad, my dad was a math professor, and he, he did a lot of early programming on mainframes, and he used to bring home these punch cards, you know, just like, talk about a user interface. Um, so I said I was gonna talk a little bit about today, and what's, what's really unique about today. I think the simplest way to think about it is that there are many concurrent innovations, and normally you see innovations happen one here, one there, but they're all happening at the same time. Uh, and they have collectively created a platform which enables entrepreneurs to change almost any business. That is the big difference. It is no longer just about you know, the next gizmo. It is no longer just about uh, whether you're gonna have a five-year run making good storage investments. As we'll talk about in a minute, Entrepreneurs are changing unimaginable kinds of businesses. I'll give you examples that'll cause you to scratch your head. Um, part of our thesis and part of the reason it's happening is just that computing is free. I mean, it is so cheap and so available and so easy to access and use that it's basically free. This is just bandwidth um, processing power and storage costs going through the floor. But this, this I mean, I don't think you can overstate how important this is. This is the game changer uh, because it allows consumers uh, to access anything, as you know, anywhere, anytime. And so these are just some of the industries that, that are being transformed. How many of you have heard of Casper? You know what Casper is? Most of you haven't heard of it. You should check it out. They're changing the mattress industry. That's what they're doing. And it's going really well. Do you know the last time anybody changed the mattress industry? A long time ago. Nothing has happened in the mattress industry for many decades. Okay, but I think it's, it's illustrative. I mean, th th what they've done, just to give you a, a snapshot, is they have a mattress which is made out of new material technology and with a different design such that it can be collapsed into a box about this big and shipped to you by UPS or even delivered same day by Uber. And and you can take it with you, you know, it's, it's kind of, a, and it's a better mattress. And it's cost effective. So it's taken off like crazy. But one of the things that's, I think, really different about today is that the physics of these businesses are different. You know, we already talked about the cost of computing is free, but the cost of acquiring customers is really, really different because of the internet and these things and, you know, all the things you guys have been studying and know about. So, you know, it's the most important thing we look at when we look at new businesses is how much does it cost to acquire a user and how much are they worth to you over time? Uh, and a business like Casper has really attractive economics for doing that. And then, of course, you can outsource anything. And the cost of having things made that you deliver to your customers has, you know, collapsed for virtually everything. Um, let's see, some other examples. I've got to scroll down here a little bit find this. How about uh, the market for people who translate languages from one language to another? You've heard of Duolingo? 
You know about Duolingo? They're changing the market for translation by having people learn how to, to learn a new language. So in the background, they take advantage of the fact that computing is free, keep that in mind, and they can use an infinite amount of it at no cost, and thereby provide a free service, which is really valuable, a way to learn a language effectively. And all the while, those users are actually translating something that can be sold. So they're changing the market for translation. I sure would, I did not see that one coming. Uh, Coursera, another company, started right here at Stanford. You know, you probably all know this story. Uh, it's, I think it was the fall of 2012. They, uh, Daphne Kohler came over for lunch and decided to turn, her husband and I convinced her to turn her project into a company on our red couch, which we're now gonna donate to the company because she wants the red couch. It's where the company started. It's unbelievable what they've done in three years. Unbelievable. They have 110 of the world's leading universities as partners. They have approaching, I think, 1,000 courses. They have 12 million or so active people learning in those courses. They have many of them now paying. The, you know, revenue is growing very fast. Um, and they've just attracted unbelievable talent because people want to change the world, and they're changing the world in really profound ways. Uh, so I think the, the system of education is changing. Pretty big industry, pretty important industry. Um, I can go on and on, actually. I have about three pages of these kinds of examples. Um, how about um, health insurance? You all thought that health insurance was the next really ripe opportunity, didn't you? Right? Health insurance? There's a guy whose name I can't recall off the top of my head who had a pretty bad experience with health insurance. He, he had a, a medical problem, which uh, happened to him after he had very successfully sold his company to Google, I think it was, for a lot of money. And um, he decided to do something about it. And he came to the realization that if companies themselves could be self-insured, health insurance would be a lot cheaper and a lot better administered than these health insurance companies. So he looked into it, and it turns out it's really hard to do. The very largest companies, for the most part, are self-insured. Actually, at NEA, we're self-insured. We're a little bit of an anomaly. Um, most small companies cannot pull this off. So he created a SaaS platform that allows for the administration of healthcare by companies inexpensively. It's packaged together with reinsurance for you know, catastrophic events and that sort of thing, and a bunch of other services. He's changing, he's enabling companies, by the way, to save 20% in their first year and 10% in each of the, ne the, uh, the next five years. That's a huge savings for a cost item which is escalating under Obamacare for companies that have high income employees. So think of everybody in Silicon Valley. Do you know how big the health insurance industry is? Neither do I. But healthcare is 18% of the economy. It's huge. I think I'll leave it there for now and we'll keep, come back to companies which I can talk about all day long. I mean, you guys know this. This is, but it's still kind of stunning to look at this. How many people who were the dominant leaders in desktop PCs are in the smartphone business at all? Talk about not understanding what business you're in. They're all gone. I mean, completely new set of players. Uh, actually, with the notable exception, I don't know what I did wrong there, but with the notable exception of Lenovo, which was a, you know, very strong in China, in the PC business, still is. Um, for the first time since the PC was invented, the entire enterprise stack is up for grabs. It really, really is. The problem is the infrastructure, the cloud plus mobile, the thing that everybody wants to move to, you know, cloud-based platform for all enterprise applications and services, whatnot, 
breaks every existing solution. They're not designed for this. They're way too expensive and they don't scale. So, you know, we just happen to pick NEA companies as representative examples here. Um, we hope they emerge as the dominant players in all these categories. Actually, VMware was not, unfortunately, an NEA company, neither was Amazon. So we did have, had to sprinkle around a, a few other companies, but it's really happening. I mean, Workday is absolutely gonna crush SAP and Oracle. They, they are dead, it is only a matter of how long it takes. If you just look at the new sales that SAP makes, as opposed to just re-upping their existing customers with some bargain that for some period of time is hard to refuse, Workday is growing faster in aggregate dollars already. They're just getting started. Um, MuleSoft, uh, run by one of my GSB classmates, Greg Schott, uh, Meteoric, they're taking on the $10 billion industry today owned by Oracle primarily, not really BMC, but Oracle and IBM. They're gonna take it all away, all of it. Not a little bit of it, all of it. I mean, these incumbents have no way to compete. They're 10 times more expensive with an inferior product. And the list goes on and on and on. We talked about this already. Cost of starting companies has gone virtually to zero. That's why we started our seed program, by the way. We wanna get in at the beginning. Even if it's for a little tiny stake, we wanna know these companies, get to know them, have them get to know us. So that when it comes time for Series A, even if we're investors with you know, four or five other of our major competitors, we have a chance to get to know the entrepreneur and differentiate ourselves. And it's only goodness for entrepreneurs, right? They get to know everybody and can create a lot of competition at the Series A level. It's what happens. But look what happens when they start to scale. They need a lot of money. Not a little bit of money, a lot of money. Actually, more money than venture firms, including us, typically provide, which is why there is a lot of room in the late stage market for a lot of new entrants. So there's one thing that worries me about today, and that's valuations. Um, they're going up like crazy. I mean, Series A valuations doubled in the last year. It's the latest NBCA data. Doubled, one year. And late stage are up 50%. So those are kind of worrisome trend lines. Um, it was only 2013 when the unicorn was coined, you know, 18 months ago. And it was, and, and, and they were all excited because there were 36 of them, right? And they counted up how many everybody had. Now there are, this is just the growth rate per year, joining the Billion Dollar Club, 25 last year, one year. In the rest of the world, it was another 13. Um, I mean, you, these are the unicorns of the big venture firms. You know a lot of these names. But as I said, this is it's actually, I think, a, a healthy thing for the most part. Because growing up in public is really hard to do. And you can never become private again, at least not easily. So we're, uh, we generally encourage our entrepreneurs to wait until you are really, really ready to be a public company. There's today no reason to go public. You can think about why you would go public. You go public, it's a big branding event. That's still true. You create a lot of liquidity for your investors. You can create that in the private markets today. You can create, for the most part, a fair amount of liquidity for early founders and companies through secondary sales. So I think it's, it's a reasonably rational thing that a lot of people are staying private longer. And conversely, it's very hard uh, to morph your business in public. I mean, if you think about it, you know, there, there are very standard metrics once you become public for how quickly you should become profitable, how much you're gonna invest in R&D or sales, all these things. And everything you say will be re remembered forever and they will compare you to everything you said before. So why not stay private a little longer? And that's what's happening here. You can see the time to IPO is now about nine years, eight and, eight and change, 8.1 years. So for those of you thinking about going into a venture capital career, this is a long-term proposition. I mean, none of these companies get to be really big in a 
short period of time. It takes, think of it as a 10 year journey at least. And the IPO is just a starting point. So you have to be extremely patient capital to really get the benefits if you're lucky enough to get into one of these game changing companies. Because it's going to take a long time. This, this is something we did for the benefit of our limited partners. But the reason I put it in here is just to show you how being early in a new sector matters a lot. Um, the, the difference in returns between being two years earlier than the average uh, venture capital firm enters a sector is very, very significant. And it also turns out to be significant down the road because you get you, you develop a reputation, hopefully a positive one, for having been associated with these earlier companies. So I, I, I'm quite sure we would never have gotten into Workday had we not been in Salesforce. We wouldn't have been in Salesforce if we weren't in WebEx. I mean, th that was an explicit part of the conversation. Uh, that's w one of the reasons they, they selected us. Um, this is just our unicorns. And the point of it is they're all over the world, actually, not just in Silicon Valley. Uh, but I was asked to talk about Silicon Valley. Um, it never ceases to amaze me how many people come to Silicon Valley and want to have one. No, they do. I remember when the prime minister of Malaysia came in 1996, escorted here by McKinsey, who had done a study for him on how to create Silicon Valley in Kuala Lumpur. What happened? Do they have one? No. That was 1996. I mean, you'd think in that period of time you could create a Silicon Valley, right? Not so easy. Actually, really, really hard. Um, it's kind of like a winning sports team. The winning sports team has an easier time recruiting the players, getting a bigger audience, more dollars, all those things. Um, but I think what I said earlier is going to change that, which is that with the ability to leverage this platform to change any industry, people are going to start companies in more places. And we are seeing it every day. We, we saw a world-class software company in Portugal recently. That would not have been in my top list of places that even have a shot at becoming Silicon Valley or creating a great company. And I don't think it will become Silicon Valley. But innovation will just be more and more distributed. I think there are two kind of special examples that are worth thinking about if your idea is to go create Silicon Valley somewhere else. The first one is Israel. Everybody knows about Israel. They call themselves the startup nation or something. Highest per capita number of startups of any place on the, on the planet. But I think they, the, the government and all the entrepreneurs immediately realized that there's no market for anything in Israel. So they better create a link to Silicon Valley. And they have really well established links to Silicon Valley. Um, their links to Silicon Valley are so well established, we don't think we need to have an office in Israel. You know, we have partners that go there a couple times a year to meet people and whatnot. But they're coming here. They start there, and they come here. And it works really well. The other model, of course, is China. I've been to China about 40 times. I helped to start our practice there. I made my first investment in April of 2004 um, and saw the company through an IPO. And eventually, eventually it was bought called Spreadtrum uh, Communications. How many of you have ever heard of Spreadtrum, by the way? You ever hear of Spreadtrum? Not a single person in here has heard of Spreadtrum. They make baseband chips for these things, for Android-based platforms at the low end of the market sold typically into the emerging world. They make 500 million phones a year, or the guts of those phones, 20 plus percent of the world market. I mean, this is, the reason I mention it is people sometimes think that you know, great technology doesn't get invented in China. That's a mistake. There is great technology being invented in China. When we funded that company in April of 2004, the market they were going after is, is referred to as the baseband chip market. This is, you could think of it as the CPU of the cell phone. 
was dominated by a company called Texas Instruments. Have you heard of that company? Okay. Texas Instruments was spending one and a half billion dollars a year on R&D and owned 45 percent of the world market for baseband chips in 2004. They don't exist anymore in this business. There were two or three other players that were spending north of a billion dollars a year in the baseband chip market. They are almost all gone. The only survivor at the high end, of course, is Qualcomm. There's a company in Taiwan called MediaTek, which is the most similar company to Spreadtrum. There's Spreadtrum. I think that's about it. And Qualcomm's the only one of those companies that had any kind of sizable position in 2004. Um, they have today, Sp Spreadtrum at the time, by the way, was investing $20 million a year total for all expenses in the company. And they successfully competed with a company that was investing a billion and a half a year. We've invested in 35 companies, $400 million in China. We have a perspective on what's going on there. That ecosystem is growing up in a very healthy way from an innovation standpoint, my, my view. Um, and because of the fact that it's segmented off from the rest of the world, there are many advantages to the Chinese entrepreneur. So we will see a lot more from China, uh, not just Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, the ones you know about. This is a little bit what I was talking about, um, you know, with the ability to start a company anywhere. I think people are also hearing more about starting companies. It's, a, it's not an unusual thing for kids uh, to drop out of college and start companies or graduate from college and start companies all over the place. I mean, when I, no one was thinking about that when I got out of college. I don't know a single person who started a company in my college class of 1,000 people anywhere near the date we graduated. You know, five, 10 years later, sure, but not right at, out of college. So this, this whole phenomena is really different. Um, I think there are threats to Silicon Valley. I remember uh, the National Venture Capital Association has an annual meeting uh, today. It's called VentureScape. And I went to one, would have been in 1999, and they had some of the leading venture investors of the time on a panel. And one of them um, was um, Bob Cagle, who's one of the founders of Benchmark. And I remember somebody asked the question in 1999, you know, how long will Silicon Valley be around? And he said, well, that's an interesting question. I grew up in Detroit. Detroit used to be the hub of innovation in America, undisputedly. Detroit went bankrupt about two years ago. I mean, the place is a disaster. So nothing is assured. Uh, and you know all the reasons to be worried, including the cost of housing. In 1980, the average house in Palo Alto cost $125,000. Today, $2 million. Uh, I'll just say, yeah. Um, have you noticed that the split between SF and South Bay is causing problems, or is that OK? Hmm. I think it's, yeah, it is causing problems. Um, I mean, there's been a general migration north uh, in terms of the companies we've funded anyway. Um, I'm sure you see that. Uh, but there are a lot of companies now that want to have a presence in San Francisco for one reason or another, usually access to talent. And so they're all trying to figure logistically how to do that, and it's putting a lot of pressure on transportation systems. Huge. I mean, you guys, I'm sure, all know this. You drive around here. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to do about it. Uh, I'm involved, uh, as Ernestine said, in the NVCA, and I would just encourage all of you to make sure that uh, you help not just the NVCA, but Silicon Valley represent itself effectively in Washington. Because people in Washington can really mess this place up. Uh, there's um, an issue right now on patent reform. There's a bill in the House, HR 9, which I think will be devastating 
to small companies if it goes through. It's being billed as um, a way to fix the problem with patent trolls, which it doesn't even do a very good job of. Um, but it has some really terrible provisions that would disadvantage small companies. Uh, if there's nobody like the NBCA or entrepreneurs like you guys to go out and educate legislators, these things just go through. It almost went through last year. It got stopped by one entrepreneur and a, a band of people he assembled with a lot of effort. Uh, so that's just something to be wary of. And we all know why it matters. This is a, a little bit of a dated study uh, that the NBCA did to measure the impact of venture capital uh, on the American economy and the world. 0.2% of GDP invested, 11% of private sector jobs today, and 21% of GDP or something close to that, 21, yeah. That's pretty amazing. We messed this up. This is, this is the golden egg for, our, for the US economy. One of the things I'm doing um, at the NBCA is having this study redone. And naturally, I thought of Stanford as the right place to do the homework and to do the research. And fortunately, we have a wonderful professor, a team of them in the business school, uh, working on that research right now. And they showed me the preliminary results the other day. Uh, and it's not for public consumption yet, but one of the findings was that in the last 10 years, venture-backed companies have created 2.3 million jobs in America in the last 10 years alone. So this matters. Um, you know, I'm an optimist. You can't not be an optimist if you're in the venture capital business. So I think the odds are that Silicon Valley is going to be around for a long time in a really healthy way, despite the headwinds and challenges and risks. Um, but there's no other place I would start a company. There's no other place I would want to be as a venture capitalist. I mean, you just have to bite the bullet, pay the taxes, and get on with it. Taxes are terrible. Anyway. Thank you. Um, so I know Scott has a hard stop at 4.30, so um, definitely open to Q&A right now. I'm going to kick off and just ask a question. Um, so I'm curious in terms of how investment decisions are made at NEA, whether that's um, um, consensus, majority voting, or um, given given there's a lot of capital to deploy, how do you make investment decisions? We're actually uh, in the process of reviewing that right now. Um, I literally presented, Peter and I presented a new plan to the general partners on Monday, and it'll be presented to the rest of the partners next Monday. Um, the way we go about making those kinds of changes is we usually assign a group of the younger people to look at whatever the issue is. And so we, we had two teams that started last summer, each of which were about five people that represented all parts of our investing practice. And they went away, and their charge was, you know, you have a, you have a clean sheet of paper. I'll tell you how we have historically done it, and then I'll come back to what we're going to do next. But just go think about it. Go talk to your friends at other venture firms and come back with a, rec you know, a set of recommendations. They did. Uh, I then, Peter and I took those two recommendations and here we are making some significant changes as of next Monday. But historically, um, most decisions have been a majority vote of the general partners um, who are informed by the votes of a larger group of people in a specific sector. So we have a tech team and a med team that operate quite autonomously for the most part. You know, things start out maybe with one or two people. They get, you know, they sort of move up to larger numbers of people as the project evolves, and then the med team or the tech team will take a vote. That vote is recorded. Uh, we as general partners, everybody, at any at NEA, almost everything is completely transparent. That's one of our core beliefs. Um, because we want, we want everybody to know what's going on, of course, but we also think that's how people learn. And we're one of the few firms that actually grows people from within. So I started as an associate in, you know, all those years ago. Um, and so the, the process is sort of bubbles up to the tech team. Then I can see a vote sheet with comments from everybody. So for a, a med biotech company, you know, I don't know that much about biotechnology, but I can see all the people in, in our partnership who know a lot about it, how they voted, and what they said. And they're all sitting there, so I can ask them. 
I can look down and I can see, you know, this person was not so excited about this. Well, why? You know, and then they, so that, that's the, the formal process results in a decision in which only the general partners vote on a, on a final investment. It's a two-stage process. So uh, we call it a hunting license and a final decision. A hunting license is uh, a formal vote uh, on a formal pro proposition, you know, how much money and at what valuation in terms to invest in a specific company that the sponsors can then go and negotiate with the company. And the expectation is if they successfully negotiate with the entrepreneur, return to the partnership having conducted all the due diligence that was required, then the vote will go forward. So most hunting licenses turn into final decisions. And if they don't, it's usually because the sponsoring team decided not to. It's not as though there's a vote and then when they come back for the final, somebody changed their mind. That, that doesn't really happen. So what about that's the process today for most decisions. Uh, for seed investments, we have two specific people who make those decisions. They make all of them. Mm -hmm. So there's two partners. Um, and for India and China, we have a separate process. We invest in public biotech companies, believe it or not. We have a team of two people that do that. They have a special investment committee of six. Because they're public decisions, they have to be made very quickly, usually. Um, and because it's public information, we don't want it to be disclosed broadly. So they operate pretty much independently. They report back what they've done. What about West Coast versus East Coast within the US? In what, in what uh, way? Investment decisions in terms of the West Coast office versus the East Coast office. Well, I mean, we're, we invest, I think, 60% of the capital out of the West Coast office, 40% elsewhere. Uh, and we have more people here. But, so this is the center of gravity. But it de the new process, by the way, um, is a more delegated decision-making process based on the size of the investment. So up to $3 million, three general partners. Up to $10 million, five general partners. Up to $25 million, I think, seven general partners. So in the future, uh, there will be investments that the East Coast doesn't see for example, that are just done on the West Coast or vice versa. Um, we're going to have to be very careful as we go into this new process to make sure everybody knows what's going on. So one of the things we'll do is in our partners meeting, instead of having a discussion and a vote on a new investment, someone who has already obtained the votes necessary from the right subgroup will pitch the rest of the partnership in you know, a brief format, five minutes. Tell us what this company is that you just invested in so that we all know what's going on. Because we worry a lot about conflicts of interest between companies. And we also need to be aware of all the companies so that we can be helpful. You know, we want to know who the people are so that we tell the entrepreneurs, you know, you can call anybody, anytime, and they'll help you. We're a team. And all the compensation works that way. So, but if they don't know about your project, it's a little harder to do. Curious about the fundraising process. You just raised how much? Is it 3.2 billion? Is that right? What was it? Something like that, yeah. So, why, why stop there? Where would that the number come about? Are people fighting to get into the fund, or is it it's pretty hard? And, and who, who's the team that leads that charge within NEA? Is there a fundraising team, or is it the mm. investing team? That yeah, good question. Um, the way we decided on the fund size is uh, we do a bottoms-up analysis. So one of the other new processes, we're always in, you know, trying to get better at how we do what we're doing. And uh, not NEA, I think it started in NEA 13, uh, we decided to, uh, may maybe three funds ago, we, we started having more formal sector allocations. So at the beginning of the fund, each sector would basically pitch the general partners and say, here's you know, how much I think we should invest in my sector, here's why, um, and make their case. Uh, and then these allocations would get sorted out. And then over the course of the fund, you know, they evolve. Uh, we relook at them every year. and and make changes. And actually, it's one of the big benefits of, of our large fund is that we can, and sometimes we've made very dramatic changes in allocations you know, through the three or four year investing cycle of a fund, which you can't do if you're in a single fund model. You have a biotech fund, it's all going to go into biotech. Well, what if biotech next year doesn't look so good? So that, that actually is quite uh, beneficial. Um, so we had the sector allocation uh, process started about three funds ago, and then we started one for individuals. Because we noticed that if, uh, if there was no limit to how much a, an individual person could invest, 
we looked back at the funds and we said, well, are we really excited about how much each of the people invested? Or would we rather have uh, given it a little thought and put some restrictions in? Because some of these new people, for example, joined and invested a ton of money, maybe faster than we wanted them to before they've proven themselves. So that was our concern. So we in instituted this individual investing process, which is getting to your question in just a second. So we now have a way to gauge exactly how much capital we would like each person to invest. And we add that up, and that's you know, roughly speaking the size of the fund. So this time, we, we very comfortably figured we had $3 billion worth of capacity. Uh, and then the fund was very oversubscribed, so it could have been a lot larger. Is there, who runs that process? Right. Um, Peter Barris runs that process. He's my co-managing partner. Um, and we have, um, we have a team, actually, headed by Suzanne King uh, for limited partner relations. Uh, and they do all the spade work and manage all the relationships day to day. And we have, after almost 40 years, a lot of limited partners. You know, we don't kick our limited partners out unless there's a really good reason to do that. So some of them, you know, back when it was a $6 million fund, might have been a, the first check came from a family in Ohio for, I don't know, $100,000 or something. Um, they're a wonderful family, and they've done extremely well by keeping their investment in each of our funds. And we've changed a lot of families' lives that way. It's kind of neat. Um, but they're not huge, and we're not going to kick them out. They were the first investors. So there's a pretty long list. I mean, most of the money is concentrated in a small number of hands. But just managing all those relationships takes a lot of work. We have a phenomenal back office in Baltimore, Maryland, where it's, you know, you don't lose people. And, uh, no one even knows they're there. And they just do an awesome job. So that, by the way, is one of the big reasons why I think we've been able to scale, because we have really good people supporting. And Peter runs that entire side of the business. I run the investing side of the business. You, somebody over here had a question. Um, you talked a lot about kind of the, the fundamentals driving the, the higher valuations. Um, but looking at the, the other side of quantitative easing and public markets not providing the the returns that investors are looking for, driving them towards private investments, you know, i.e. venture capital. You now see entrepreneurs raising rounds just to hold on to cash because they feel like this is a, the easiest time to ever get capital in the history of any industry ever. There was um, an article about that in the New York Times over the weekend. Right, yeah. yeah Slack. Like Slack and I think Wealthfront have both like publicly admitted that they are just no, no idea what to do with the money, but it's right. a good time to raise it. Um, does that worry you at all as an investor in these, in these sorts of companies who, where the founders are saying, we want cash because we think that we're, you know, they're not saying it directly, but we're overvalued? As I said, the one thing I'm worried about is valuations. I think there are, uh, not all of these private unicorn companies are going to work out. You know, they're still startups. Some of them have a long way to go. Uh, I think as a class, they're going to work out really well. You want to have a portfolio. You don't want to just pick one. Um, so on the whole, I'm not worried about it. I think what it represents is, is risk capital, which is needed for these companies to fuel their growth. And some of them are just going to take the money. But you know, we invested in the last round of Uber, you know, $41 billion. That's precisely 40 times higher than any valuation we have ever gone in at as a first investment, 40 times higher. So you might think we're crazy. I don't think so. I mean, I can't tell you what the numbers are. That is the most amazing business I've ever seen, period. I think we're going to make, I, did, we did this right before we went out to raise the money. So you, you think you're going to get a little scrutiny for something like that, right? None of our limited partners challenge that. So, so then do you think that there's perhaps almost like, there's like two different classes of... They asked about it, by the way, but... <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and this is like coming from uh, Evan Spiegel of the, the winners in each market you know, are getting to become the winners so much faster than has ever been done in history. So it's mm -hmm. becoming clear that they're almost worth those valuations. Mm -hmm. But then there's all these other companies that are in second and third place. Uh, that look up at the top and say, well, I think that I'm maybe 80% of that valuation, but in reality are probably way, way less. Mm -hmm. um, yet Silicon Valley doesn't seem to be giving them the way, way less that they probably deserve. Do, do you agree with Evan on that kind of 
the market leaders are deserving them and then everyone else probably is a bit overvalued? I think it really depends on the sector. I think there are some sectors that by their nature are more winner take all sectors. Um, and Evan is absolutely right about those sectors. Uh, and then there are other sectors where it's just unlikely that one company will dominate the entire landscape. Uh, that's more likely to be the case in businesses where uh, they're offline businesses where you have to have you know, human beings out selling things and that sort of thing. Uh, some of the online marketplaces, for example, I think are gonna be winner take all games for sure. So you spoke a lot about uh, culture of transparency and promoting from within uh, at NEA. I'd love to get your thoughts on how you think of VC as an apprenticeship model, as many people frequently allude to, mm -hmm. and what do you do specifically at NEA to bring along junior talent uh, towards a path of partnership? Well, it's, uh, I mean, it clearly is an apprenticeship business at some level because there's so many different things to learn along the way. Um, and it's, it's nearly impossible to learn them quickly because you only learn them through the development of the companies you invest in. So if a company takes 10 years to mature, you're not gonna learn the lessons about what to do as the company goes public and beyond you know, for a number of years if you're an early stage investor, for example. So it, it takes a long time and it just naturally uh, benefits from uh, pairing up people who have a lot of experience with those who are New. It's one of the wonderful things about our industry that there's sort of a role for experienced people and a role for really young people. Um, the young people, of course, uh, are more typically aware of the trends and the new technologies and probably know the young entrepreneurs better than the older folks like me. Um, but the younger partners benefit typically quite a lot by teaming up with somebody who's had a lot more experience, sometimes just for competitive reasons. I mean, just think about winning a new investment. Um, you know, playing as a team matters a lot. And we just discovered that we've always played as a team, but we realized in a couple of competitive battles a few years ago how really effective that was, and so now we do it even more intentionally. Uh, in terms of how we mentor young people, everybody has a mentor. We spend a lot of time as a general partner group talking about each person several times a year. We have off-sites where we go away and just spend the whole day talking about people. Um, we have um, specific stages in the journey, I guess, that uh, are publicly published inside the firm so you know what you have to be able to do in order to move up. Uh, and then I think the most valuable thing is we have a lot of people who've done it. So they know what, it's, what the challenges are. You know. If you just started this process and the general partners didn't come from the bottom, they wouldn't necessarily know how to be helpful. Uh, as a follow-up, I'm curious, what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned through your almost 20-year uh, journey within uh, NEA? The most important thing is the people. You know, companies don't fail because the technology didn't work. Very rarely that's the problem. Companies fail because Maybe the team gave up. Maybe they didn't work together very well. Um, maybe they made bad decisions. Maybe they had bad investors who gave them bad advice. So it's the people that matter the most. I would say another big one is capital efficiency matters enormously to the personal returns that the entrepreneurs end up with and the returns that the venture investors end up with. So. And, and, and this, this, this notion of capital efficiency, in my experience, is almost binary. It's, it's like something that people are born with. They either have it or they don't. You know, they're either really careful with money in every possible way, or they're not. And the difference between those two things is enormous. I mean, you can just think about it in the simplest possible terms. If you spend, and, and the differences are, are big. This, you know, Person A and person B, same kind of company, same opportunity. One person will spend half as much money as the other, or a tenth as much money as the other. They just strategically are thinking about how to spend very little money and still get the same high quality result. Well, let's just say person A spends half as much as person B. They have twice as long to figure it out. That turns out to be enormously important. You know, it's one thing 
to be able to predict an opportunity that's going to happen in the future, it is a whole lot harder to predict exactly when it's going to happen. If you have the luxury of time because you have hoarded your resources, raised capital at the right time and not spent too much of it, which is why I think what these guys are doing is actually smart, um, huge advantage. Um, and then, you know, as an investor, I just think you have to be really, a couple other things. First of all, um, companies never get to be really big companies if they never had the chance to go after a really big market. So if you can't imagine that this thing is going to have billions or tens of billions of dollars of revenue someday, it's probably not going to be a really big, enduring company. It just isn't. So you have to only go after the things that can be really big, and you have to be really patient. And don't just sell the company when the first person comes in and offers you something that seems really attractive. I mean, you asked me to talk about uh, unicorns. One of my favorites is a Stanford story, Tableau Software. You know, Tableau uh, has done more things right as a startup, I think, than any company I've been involved in. They're incredibly capital efficient. They built the entire business, which in the last four years has grown 78% a year at the top line with $1.7 million of capital. $1.7 million. Now, they raised five. They had an OEM license for their technology with what is now Oracle that was Hyperion before Hyperion got bought. So they had a, a little income stream from that, which offset some of their expenses. Um, but they're very careful with money. Uh, but Tableau wouldn't be here today if they had taken the first offer to sell the company. Seven years in, they had a really attractive offer to sell the company. And after a lot of deliberation, I mean, this would have been totally game changing for the founders. You know, like a lot of money, walk away, never have to do anything again. They turned it down. And, you know, that was 21x ago. So you got to be patient. Um, so you said that valuations start being a bit worrying. There are also articles all the time right now saying that we are back at the levels of investing of the 2000s, that valuations are reaching a record. Uh, if there is a market correction at one point, where do you think it starts? Who would change behavior first? Are, the, like, are these like the later stages investors? Is it Wall Street? Where does it come from? when it starts? I think it's an external shock to the world economy. That's what will scare risk capital away from this asset class. You know, you, you know all those risks as well as anybody. Um, that's what I worry about. I think there will be volatility within the asset class because it is, you know, things will go up and then somebody will get scared and things will go down for a while. But I think the fundamentals are so attractive that if you're patient, it's a, it'll, it'll work out really well as an asset class overall. Um, but you have to be ready for maybe it goes down 50%. Maybe Series A valuations, which went from 20 to 40 million on average last year, go back to 20. And you had just invested this year at 40. Well, that's really terrible unless you hold it until it's worth 4 billion, and then nobody cares. Over here. So uh, in 2012, you made uh, a couple of investments, large investments, in the education space, Edmodo and Coursera. Mm. I'm just curious, do you still see education three years down the road as, as a promising space to invest in? Yeah, well, I think we've made a dozen now. And absolutely, we do. Yeah, really exciting. Hi, um, I'm curious to know more about um, who's sponsoring, what the motivations are that are that's driving the uh, the patent reform uh, bill that you uh, you mentioned earlier on the Hill. Google and Cisco. And why? What, what are their interests in it? Uh, I haven't spoken to them, so I can only surmise. I think they're they really don't like uh, patent trolls, and they've been, they get sued a lot. Um, and in their core business, they don't really need patent protection. So they'd rather just make it easier to uh, 
they think keep patent trolls at base. Some of the, the aspects of the legislation that I think are worrisome as an example, uh, there would be a mandatory loser pays provision. So the idea is, of course, to dissuade someone from making a frivolous lawsuit. So on the surface, that sounds OK. Um, and if it's Google and Cisco that are in the process of suing each other, probably that's what will happen. You know, There'll be less frivolous lawsuits because, but if it's Google and a startup that has $2 million in the bank, it's game over. The patent, is, you know, you're now the startup and you're facing a lawsuit that's going to cost you $5 million to defend or $3 million to defend. You may be out of business. Um, and so it doesn't have the same dynamic. Another aspect of it, which is worrisome to us as investors and should be worrisome to entrepreneurs, is that uh, there's a provision in the legislation called the joiner, which essentially pierces the corporate veil and requires the investors to be on the hook if the startup goes out of business and can't afford the patent lawsuit. So now investors, you know, one of the reasons venture capital works so well is you can only lose one times your money. Well, that wouldn't be true anymore. That would probably dissuade a lot of investors if you sort of had this potentially open-ended liability. And then the last question is, uh, in your estimation or judgment of, of the situation, how likely is this to pass, or, or do you see it going into uh, backroom litigation and, and compromise? I don't know. I, I have it on very good authority that a similar bill will be introduced in the Senate uh, quite soon, maybe this week or next week. And it'll be very interesting to see. I, I've spoken to some of the people involved. Um, they, have, they can't tell me what it's going to contain, but they've said that some of these issues will be mitigated. And there's, you know, we'll see. Um, so it was encouraging to hear uh, that you mentioned there was a balance today between kind of capital and opportunities to chase, mm -hmm. and that that hadn't necessarily existed. And, and that balance today kind of is a, is a good thing for venture capital, obviously. Um, but I'm curious how you think about that in terms of you know are there market size assumptions that sort of are sky high that that's dependent on that kind of could break if if sort of market sizes you know, are, are kind of not predicted well. Um, you know, how do you think about that differently as chair of the NVCA versus chair of, N or, you know, managing partner of NEA as well? Because mm -hmm. I think that's probably different. Well, I think as chair of the NVCA, I think the industry is in a reasonable equilibrium. Um, so I feel good about that. As a partner at NEA, um, you know, I worry that there are these real pockets of exuberance that make investments that we think would be really attractive just priced way beyond. I mean, this has happened probably five times in the last month where we've had the opportunity to invest in a company which we think is a fantastic opportunity at valuation X. And we've, in the cases I'm thinking of, won the opportunity to lead the deal until somebody else doubles the price triples the price, quadruples the price, five times the price, literally. And these are you know, mostly later stage companies where the valuations are already in the hundreds of millions. And we do our math, and we think the market size and progress and all this stuff lets us be excited about stretching to a $200 million acquisition, you know, valuation. And then you know, over the course of the next five days, somebody offers them a billion. Like, OK. I mean, we've been priced out of probably 90% of the tech, later stage tech offerings that we have most been most interested in in the last six months. You feel that's balanced out by valuations we're able to get in at a competitive price? Because you were mentioning balance. So well, so we, we sort of have a barbell philosophy, which is um, you know, pick the ones that uh, are the really Goliath long-term winners if you can and pay up for those, because ultimately they're going to turn into really wonderful companies. Uh, they've created an asset that is enduring, and their leadership is well established. And you definitely pick the number one, not the number two or three. So that's one style of investing. And then the other one is to go early. You know, the earlier you, you know, the, the valuations for things that are not yet hot are dramatically different. Uh, so if you can identify something early, then it's usually reasonable. 
and stay away from the stuff in the middle where you know you basically have to pay an unreasonable price without having the risk taken out of the project. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.